In the previous video, we had obtained this. That is to say, we had managed to implement the header image. What we're going to do now, in this video, is to implement the logo and the menu. And we're going to leave for another video the implementation of the change of screen when navigating. That is to say, that when I click on this Attractions option, for example, not only the page of attractions will load here, which will be in the content placeholder, but also everything will change as necessary, including the hero image and the text that's overlaid. If we have time in this video, we'll implement the text as well. Otherwise, we'll leave it for the next one. In Figma, we see that they're implemented as a component that contains another component with a logo, which in turn consists of an icon and two texts, and a container with auto layout, that is flex for the menu, a succession of items. We can also see that Chechu grouped both components in this web header, also in a container with auto layout, and we can see it clearly in this gap that appears here. And if we extract the CSS properties, we finally verify it. And here we see, graphically, that gap between the two elements, the menu and the logo. But we're not going to implement it as a flex, but as a table. Because as we can see, the logo is aligned on the left with this title. So it'll be easier to use a table to align them. The table will have three rows, the middle one for spacing. Anyway, for the moment, let's make it a single row, thinking only about the logo and menu. Later, we'll add the other two. We can always imagine many ways to implement a layout. I'm going to choose to place the icon in one column, the words travel agency of the logo in another column, and the third column for the menu itself, which I will choose to implement just like Chechu did with a flex. It'll be a succession of buttons in horizontal direction, one for each action. There'll be buttons and not text blocks because of what we said when we talked about accessibility. I prefer a flex in this case rather than a table because precisely it gives me more flexibility. Each button will occupy the space it needs according to the number of letters in the text. It's particularly important if we want the application for several languages. And I can also distribute them evenly through the gap property applied to the flex class. Here, Chechu didn't realize, and I'm sure because I've just asked her, that what she did was to set fixed widths for the spaces of each text. And that was what she distributed evenly, at 12 pixels from each other. But in this way, note that the space between the text home and trips is much bigger than between attractions and about, for example. And this is a mistake. In addition, if I want, in the event that the screen width is not enough to contain all the texts, instead of a horizontal scroll bar to make a wrap and show some of the texts of the options, let's say, of the menu in a second line, then I can't get that with a table, and I can get that with a flex. Let's start by inserting a table with three columns. In the first one, we'll place the travel agency icon. In the second one, we'll place a text block with the caption, for now, Travel Agency. And in the third one, we'll place a flex container. In this flex, we'll insert the six buttons, one for each action. To this flex container, we're going to set the accessible role, list, to indicate precisely that it'll be a list of items. We can already give it horizontal alignment on the right. We can see that the direction of the flex is the correct one, a row. In wrap, for now, let's leave the default option that's not to wrap. Let's change the justification of the content to flex end, so that all the buttons are justified in relation to the end of the flex and not the beginning. 
so they leave the free space in front and not at the end. The alignment of the items regarding the other axis, Y, we will want it centered, but for now, I'll leave the default. We'll see that later. Now let's set the table dimensions. Column style, row style, height. We can set the height of the table to 43 dips. And then the icon will be 37 dips wide. So we'll give that width to column one. Then pasted without spaces is the text travel agency, which adds 62 plus 65, 127. So we could give column two a width of 150 dips and column three, 100% of the remaining width. So 37 dips, 150 dips, 100%. What about the row or table height? It would be this one of 43 dips. And we see that all the controls are vertically centered in relation to their edges. Okay, so I place the 43 dips here. Automatically, the height is going to be that same size. And then I select the three elements. Here, the flex. And I set the vertical alignment property for the three to middle. Now, where is this table located inside the canvas that contains it? We have to provide its absolute position. And it's from the top, 72 dips. From the left, 73, and from the right, 157. This is enough. From the bottom, it'll be remaining 100% of the canvas height. So, top is 72 dips. The height of the table was 43 dips. And so the bottom is the remaining 100% left 73 and right 157. Let's try what we've done. Well, we have a few things to work on, don't we? To begin with, the topography styles of the texts. In the base DSO, we have the style of the menu labels. So let's begin by assigning this class to all the buttons of the menu. We select all of them, and we change the class for this, and we see that indeed it was changed in all of them. We had not defined a class for the topography style of these texts. We see that Chechu hadn't created a style, and that the only difference between one text and the other is the font weight. One is 400, the other 700. Well, Let's copy the CSS because we'll have to define a class for these texts. I remove these properties that will be those of the default font, so I'm not going to need them. I remove these two that are from the element in Chechu's flex, and the one that I will need to add besides these four will be the color of our gray 00 token. I copy these four, and in the DSO of the master panel, I add a class that I'll call like this. Later, we'll see why the name contains travel. I paste the properties. I add the color one. And I associate the class with the text block. Let's give it a try. If this icon does not appear, you can do a rebuild all and try again, or reinsert the icon in the KB. When we moved the icons module in the assets video, I don't know if you remember, they may have been internally misplaced there. It's fixed, as I'm telling you. Something strange is happening. These texts are looking gray and not white. The reason is, they're below the mask. I had left the default Z order for this table, zero, and the mask was set to one. I'm going to set it to 2 so that it's above. Let's try it now. Good. 
Now we have to work on the menu that's not right. But we also need to change the font weight of this text so that it looks 700 and not 400. Let's start there. And then we can devote the rest of the time, more calmly, to the menu itself. As we're in the web application, we can change the format of the text to HTML so that the caption can be interpreted as HTML. This will allow us to assign another class to the text agency through the HTML span tag. We have the class of the text block, header, logo, title, travel, and will assign to agency the class that we'll create, header, logo, title, agency. To be able to change the weight of the font to the word agency. That's all we want to do. We want everything else to take the properties of header, logo, title, travel. Then we copy this text. We come to DSO, and we're going to specify this class. The only thing we're going to do is change the font weight from 400 to 700. And here we can see it. What we've just seen doesn't mean that Angular will allow placing any HTML in the text blocks and in the editable fields with HTML formatting. Actually, it'll remove any definition of a style attribute that's placed there. But what it does allow is what we did, using DSO classes inside that HTML. Quite the opposite of what happens with Android or Apple. They don't allow DSO classes to be used within HTML, and they don't remove the style attribute. So in principle, for the solution to work for both cases, that is to say, for Angular and also for Android and Apple, we would need to add a style attribute where we set the properties of the class that, in our case, we have it in the DSO. In this way, when running Angular, it'll remove everything that has to do with a style attribute. It will not take it into account. But it will take into account the class. And in the opposite case, if we execute for Apple or for Android, it'll eliminate disregard the class, and it'll take into account the style attribute. Since for desktop size, we'll only have the Angular application, in this case, we don't have to do anything. And now, to the menu. If we inspect it, as we have it so far, here we see the table that corresponds to the flex, and that it has a cell for each button. So here we see the cell of the first button, the button, and its caption. And the same for the other buttons. Note that it allows each button to grow so that it occupies equally all the free space of the flex. This is due to the flex grow property at one of each one of the buttons. Let's see what happens if we remove them. In Genexus, we see that although the content is justified according to the end of the flex, each button will have by default the flex grow property set to 1. Let's see the description of the property. It determines how much this child will grow if there's free space to distribute among the other items in the line. If the item has a positive value for this property, the free space will be distributed proportionally among all the items that have a positive value. They all have the same value by default, 1. So let's select all the buttons and change their value to 0, so that they occupy exactly their space and no more. Let's run it. If we now inspect it, we see all the buttons next to the end of the flex, and no spaces between them. To give them a uniform spacing, so that the distance between the end of one caption and the beginning of the other is the same, 
Let's try the gap property with 45 pixels, for example. Well, it looks good. There we see clearly how they're justified against the end of the flex. That's why there's all this free space in front and how this gap of 45 works between them. This is a flex level property and we don't have it as a static property of the control, so we'll have to specify it in a class, which I'll call menu table. And there I place the gap property. Now we would have to think about how to implement the indicator of the selected option. In Figma, we see how Chechu implemented each option as a vertical flex, with the text above and the indicator as a line below. Since this is an action, we use a button in Genexus and not text. And like any control, it has four borders, one on each side. It'll be enough for us that the borders at the top and at the bottom have a positive value, but are transparent for all the buttons. And on the other hand, the one at the bottom has color only for the selected button. Let's try with this element. The property is border, and I'll use the logical one and not the physical one, so it'll be border block, with which I'll be referring to the two borders in vertical direction, the beginning and the end. If I want only the end one, then I enter end. And there I specify that it'll be three pixels, for example, with a solid line. And the third parameter would be the color, for example, green. This 2.4 instead of three is a floating point precision error. It usually occurs if the screen is zoomed in multiples other than 100%, which is the case. Let's not pay attention to it now. Note that by giving 2.4 to the border, the height of the button will be of this value, so that together they add up to 43 pixels of the height of the flex. What's the problem with this? We see that the flex has the align items property with the default value, which is stretch. This causes each item to stretch to vertically occupy the entire height of its cell, which in turn will occupy the entire height of the flex. In this case, 43 pixels. But each button box includes not only the content of the button, but also padding, border, and margin. So, if we leave a lower border of three pixels, what we'll see is that the text of the button will not be centered in the middle. And therefore, it won't be centered in relation to the travel agency logo. In this somewhat messy drawing, I represent this situation with the button on the right, where I'm leaving a bottom border larger than the top one, which in our case is zero. The bottom one is three pixels, the top one is zero. And by doing this, the content of the button is not going to be centered. That's the problem. Changing the alignment of the flex items to center does not solve the issue. The only thing that it does is that the height of the element is not the height of the flex, but it corresponds to the height of the text of the button plus padding, border, and margin. So it'll be 32 pixels instead of 43 pixels. But as far as center alignment is concerned, we're in the same situation. One solution is to give them the same thickness to both borders, as in the example on the left. There, we'll have the text vertically centered and associate the top one with transparent color. To test it, let's select the element corresponding to the home button. This property is governing the style of this particular element. In this other selector, we have everything that applies to all the buttons of the flex cells. So let's try to set border block there. That is, it'll be valid for top and bottom of three pixels, solid, and transparent color. And then for the element that's selected, we don't need to repeat this, but just give it green color. So we choose this property and the value green. By doing this, we'll have applied this property for all the buttons. 
and in particular, for each one, the color of the bottom border is changed from transparent to the screen, for the corresponding ones at the right time. In fact, if we go to Figma, the color will be primary, and the three pixels are fine. We will not pay attention to this radius at this time. Then to the class that all the buttons have, which governs the typography style of labels, let's add another class that I'll call menu button, to which I'll assign the transparent border at the bottom and at the top. And then I'll create another class to change the color of the bottom border to the primary color. For now, I'm going to assign it to the home button so that we can see the style. When we study the navigations there, we'll see how to change it dynamically according to what's loading in the content placeholder. It may seem like there's a great distance between the text and the border line. Remember, it's the button which is occupying the entire height of the cell, which is occupying the entire height of the flex, because we had left the default value to the aligned items property, which was stretch. If we change it to center, we achieve the minimum height necessary to hold its content plus padding, border, and margin. And also, that it's centered in the middle. We achieve this with the static property at flex level, There's a bug in the abstract editor that causes the buttons to be hidden, but they're there. It's only a visual problem. In the Genexus web editor, it's already corrected. In fact, if we run, we see everything as we expected. One last thing about the menu. See what happens if we decrease the screen width. The buttons start to get smaller to fit in the space available to them, leaving the gap we indicated, of course. One of the features offered by the Flex container unlike the table, is that it allows wrapping so that the items that no longer fit in the row are placed in another row. We're not interested in this for our case, but I wanted to show it anyway. And look where the property is located. Remember that Chechu put together other designs for the tablet screen size, where the menu will be the classic hamburger and for phone size as well. We'll come back to these breakpoints when we talk about multi-experience in the next module. The question we're asking now is what happens in the range between this screen width, which is 768 pixels, and this other one, which is the one we're working on now, of 1440 pixels. Ultimately, we would have to make sure that our design works across that range something that's not happening here. The wrap in this case would not be a desired behavior. We could think about decreasing the gap, but even so, for this size of 770 pixels, we could not get it to look good. At this point, we would have to talk to the designer because this intermediate scenario is not intended in the design she gave us. We might have to design another layout for the master panel for that intermediate size for that gray area, let's say, where we don't use this flex table, but where we implement a hamburger menu. I'll take this opportunity to comment that if we need more sophisticated controls that include design and behavior, we can include them in Genexus by defining user controls. In other words, objects in which we can set the HTML and minimally intervene so that it can be used in any Genexus object with an interface. That is to say, we incorporate it to the KB and it's already available to be used. This will be valid for the web platform, both Angular and Net and Java. Now let's quickly add what's missing from the header to finish implementing it. The text that stands out over the image. Remember that its typography style was H1. And let's copy its content to the clipboard. It's aligned to the left together with the travel agency icon, and that's why we had thought of using the table. Now, let's extract the measurements. 
the height of the row will be 330 pixels. And from that of the menu, it will be at this other distance, 96 pixels. Clearly, we'll choose to implement the text not as a text block, but as a variable, since its content will vary from screen to screen. We then insert two rows to the table. The second one will be 96 pixels, and the third one will be 330 pixels. In the third one, we insert a variable control named header title and varchar data type. It'll be read only and without showing the label. But we'll also want it to expand to fill the three columns. And we'll want its content to be vertically aligned in the middle. On the other hand, its class will be the one we had called H1 when we introduced all the classes for the topography in the preparation module. Let's assign a value to it in the client start event. For now, we'll leave it like this, static. Let's give it a try. If we want to keep it always in exactly three lines, like here, and exactly these, adding new lines will be enough. Good. Now we're ready to implement the navigations, managing to change the header according to what's being loaded in the content placeholder each time. We'll continue in the next video.